So if you uh, if we do call on you to ask a question um, and you don't want to um, share your video or audio, just make sure that you move, uh, turn your camera off or mute yourself uh, to not be captured on video. Uh, otherwise, we encourage you to keep your camera and camera on, um, but mute yourself during the conversation unless you're speaking. Um, my name is Andy Salvania. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm the executive director for New York Tech Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization that works to create an equitable and accessible tech ecosystem here in New York City. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, in this session of Don't Panic, Let's Talk. Uh, this, I believe, is our fourth uh, session where we bring together uh, an expert in the field to talk about how they're navigating the path of uh, during COVID. Um, 19 crisis. Um, before we get to the conversation, and I turn it over to, to Miha Baldwin uh, from Grasshopper to facilitate, uh, just a few quick words of thank you uh, to our sponsors that make this possible. Um, thank you to all of our annual sponsors for New York Tech Alliance uh, that make uh, this and other programming possible. Um, everybody from Xander to the CEO's right hand, Grasshopper Bank, of course, Google, EY, um, and Work Better, uh, to name a few. Um, if you want to learn more about them, please check out our website. Um, if you want to learn more about our organization and everything that we do, all of our programming and events, uh, please uh, take a look at us at nytech.org. Um, and then a special thank you to Grasshopper Bank for helping facilitate this series of events. Um, they're a fantastic digital bank serving uh, the innovation community and founders, uh, their companies, and um, uh, all partners in the ecosystem. Um, if you like this event and other events that we do, uh, please, we have a few that are upcoming. We're launching actually our New York Tech Latinas Tech Talks. Uh, that's going to happen on Instagram Live on May the 19th at 1 p.m. Um, the next session of Don't Panic Let's Talk will be on uh, Thursday, May 21st um, at noon. And then our uh, next New York Tech Meetup, uh, the program that we're most known for, uh, will happen on June the 2nd at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we'll be doing a very special celebration of Immigrant Heritage Month, uh, showcasing a, a full uh, panel of amazing uh, immigrant founders. Um, and that takes us to today's event. I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to Miha uh, and mute myself. So Miha, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, for those on the uh, East Coast, uh, happy lunch. For those on the West Coast, uh, good morning. I hope you have your coffee, um, which is where I'm at right now on my second <laughs> cup already. Um, do appreciate everybody coming to this. I know that that most of us are probably Zoomed out at this point uh, when it comes to events and, and meetings and whatnot, since 90% of our interactions are done over this interface. Uh, so... What we try to do in these is to keep it very informal and mellow um, and not make it something that feels like you have to either perform or, or ask great questions or uh, do anything more than, than participate. We do like participation. This is not uh, generally the idea is not to have somebody talk for an hour and you just listen, but actually for you to have access to experts that you can ask questions about the things that, that matter most to you. Um, and each session, what we're trying to do is two things, is one is bring in a founder or an area expert to talk specifically about their own business, what they're doing during this time, um, and how they're thinking about whatever the topic is. And in this point, we're talking about marketing and branding uh, and growing your funnel and community. Um, and, uh, and then give you the opportunity to ask questions. And the way that we'll ask questions are either just ask them, <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, if that works for you or put it into the chat and I can grab them and, and ask. Uh, if you do wanna do it privately, feel free to private message me or Andy um, and then we'll get to it. So if you don't want your name associated uh, with it, feel free to, to do it that way. Um, I'm very excited for today's speaker and, and area expert. Um, uh, as I've learned more about her business and, and what she's accomplished, it's pretty great. Um, and I always do this badly right, when I introduce people, so I refuse to do it now. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow Allie to introduce herself so we don't miss any of the good things. I ask only one thing, Allie, is that you, no humility. 
be very honest and open about all the cool things that you're doing. And I'm going to turn okay. it over to you. That sounds great. Uh, thank you, Mika. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I think this is an incredible series and just an incredible resource for founders. Um, you know, I started building my company in New York um, and I didn't know about resources like this when I was um, doing that. So I think it's incredible all that you guys are doing. Um, I have since moved out to LA, so I am too on the West Coast um, and it's the morning. So if you hear my kids kind of screaming in the background, um, I, I apologize. I guess that's the new normal though for these Zoom conversations. Um, and I, I echo the sentiment that I think everybody is a little bit zoomed out. I think there's been a lot of research that's come out about how exhausting, um, you know, talking at your computer screen can be all day long. So um, I would greatly appreciate to make this as informal as possible and really just answer everyone's questions um, and um, just get to the, to the things that everybody wants to talk about um, instead of making it super formal. Um, but just in terms of an introduction, uh, my name is Ali Kassir. Um, I am the founder of Robin. Um, so Robin is a community-driven digital platform that connects women and families with uh, maternal wellness resources, tools, and access to providers. Um, our mission is really destigmatizing, demystifying, and democratizing the entire path to parenthood from fertility to um, early parenthood. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the ways I like to describe us being different, maybe from other um, maternal content platforms or resource platforms or, um, you know, marketplaces is that, you know, we are really kind of there to support the parents, the aspiring parents the expecting parents, the new parents. I think, you know, we're at a moment in time where we're recognizing that yes, um, when you create families, babies are born or babies are brought into a family. Um, and that baby needs a lot of love and care and support and gear and um, that there's a lot of companies that are kind of supporting that aspect of parenthood. Um, but we believe that a parent has also been born. Um, and how do we support that person um, with, you know, everything that they need? So um, we, um, if you want to learn more just about our product and what we're building, um, our website is wearerobin.co. Um, we're very active on Instagram at wearerobin. We have in total, like a 35,000, um, you know, community of women across, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and our newsletter. Um, and um, we have about 70 providers live on our site right now. So those would be mental health professionals, dietitians, acupuncturists, uh, doulas, lactation consultants, um, any sort of wellness provider that specializes in maternal, so specializes from fertility to early parenthood, um, and is, is complementary to um, whatever you're doing with your primary care physician, be that your OBGYN, your reproductive endocrinologist, fertility doctor. Um, so we really are the, that like complementary wellness services that you would look for on your journey to parenthood. Um, we've also since launched some amazing maternal education classes. Um, we have a three hour childbirth ed class, um, all virtual, uh, feeding your baby class, um, and also a trying to conceive class. Um, and those were all actually created during the pandemic. So I'm happy to talk about what the strategy was there in terms of getting these resources out to you know, fam women and families who maybe had their hospital class canceled, their in-person classes canceled, or suddenly were kind of like stuck at home with, you know, very little support or resources during this time. So um, I think that's probably um, where the discussion's going to go in terms of how we're kind of reacting and pivoting to um, COVID-19. So I, I won't spend too much time there. 
Um, but hopefully that gives um, a really good just overview of who we are and what we're doing and what our mission and, and values are. Um, and then, yeah, I'm happy to get into the um, details and, and questions and elaborate on what we've been doing during COVID. Awesome. Thank you. Let's um, let's dive a little bit into uh, your 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 founder story. Um, what what brought you to start Robin? Like you were working at J.P. Morgan, yeah, and, <laughs> you know, and doing pretty well there. And all yeah. of a sudden, you said, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go do the dumb thing and be." A <laughs> what what took you there? Yeah. So just a little bit about my background. So my educational background is in engineering. I got my undergraduate degree from Penn in engineering. And then I went to go work on Wall Street. I worked on G at JP Morgan for eight years on the trading floor. Um, I was having a ball there, frankly. Um, I was like rising up and getting promoted and we were doing interesting deals. And I was really passionate about being potentially being, you know, a female leader at the firm. And um, honestly, like our family plans just, just really kind of like took a turn for the worse. We were trying to get pregnant for a while and it wasn't working. And the whole infertility experience really turned my whole world upside down. And suddenly kind of everything was in perspective. And I decided just to take a sabbatical from JP Morgan and just take some time off because as fun as the job was, I mean, it was grueling. I was, you know, on 6am flights almost every week to see clients, um, you know, crazy stressful trading floor days. And I think, you know, my body and, you know, my mind and body was telling me to take a little break and maybe that would help with the fertility journey that we were on. So I took a sabbatical and during that time, I just focused on myself and my wellness and mothering myself. And it was so empowering to be able to, one, I think, make healthy choices during that time and to have the, the time and space to do it. Of course, not everyone can do that. I was in a very privileged position. Um, but the other thing was I found this like tribe of support. So um, one, I started sharing my journey on social media. And this was before anyone was really sharing vulnerable moments, um, like infertility, miscarriage, these really uh, stigmatized topics. Um, so I, I suddenly had like this wonderful online community of people who were supporting me and sharing as well. Um, but then I also had, was connecting with maternal wellness providers. So I was working with a reproductive acupuncturist. I was working with you know, an exercise professional that um, specialized in pre-pregnancy. I was working with a reproductive psychiatrist. Reproductive psychiatry is this entire field of mental health professionals that just focus on these topics of fertility, um, you know, perinatal mood disorders, uh, miscarriage and loss. Um, so I was suddenly like open to this world and I was able to really like shift my perspective from being, you know, very like upset and angered and alone and isolated in what I was going through to being really empowered. And, um, you know, I, um, I really believe there was so much opportunity to make a difference, um, and, um, you know, contribute to the space that was just like burgeoning. Um, and I never went back to JP Morgan. Um, after a, a while, we did get pregnant through IVF with our twins. And I think I launched the original company, which was called Fertile Girl, um, the, this, the original name and, and brand at the time, the same month that I had my twins. Um, my twins are now three. We've since, you know, done many pivots, rebranded. Uh, we raised our first round of capital in November of last year. So very fortunate timing for us, given how, you know, the markets have, have closed up a bit now. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I guess, a little bit of my founder story. Hopefully that um, adds a little bit more detail. And then, so let's talk a little bit about COVID. And then yeah. what I'll do is jump into some of the questions that um, have come up. So you hear there's a, so was the majority of the business, uh, this marketplace where you're connecting experts and consumers, most of those services are done in person. 
A lot of them are. A lot of them are shifting to, we're shifting to digital already, right? So a lot of people were starting to connect with dietitians, mental health professionals, coaches, um, virtually, even before the pandemic. Although to your point, there are definitely a lot of the services that we offer that are still mostly done in person, which would be like lactation support, doula support, massage therapy, acupuncture. Um, and it was always our belief that we wanted to build an inclusive marketplace that if you wanted to, these services virtually, you could get them virtually. But if you also wanted that in-person experience, um, then you could have that as well. So we were always planning on including both. Um, but, you know, we're not building out physical spaces. So we always had the plan of being an all digital platform. I think the pandemic just accelerated everything. For instance, you know, we were always planning on having this revolutionary childbirth class. You know, we're here in LA, we have access to the like the best people in entertainment and filmmakers. We wanted to take that hospital birth class where you have a 65 year old nurse talking at you for three hours and you're sitting in an uncomfortable chair and like totally throw that out the window. We wanted to create a class that would show not just the nurse perspective and the OBGYN perspective, but also the mental health, the nutrition, pelvic floor, all these different issues, right? And, and, and make this really holistic childbirth class. And, um, you know, we had set aside a budget for it. We had, you know, we were getting the production ready. And of course, COVID comes. And, you know, all of a sudden, it's like the need has never been greater because all the hospital classes are canceled, um, you know, and people like really need this tomorrow. So I think, you know, three days, you know, into the quarantine that we were home, we knew we had to get it up like immediately. And we got our childbirth class up on a Zoom webinar just like this. We had 700 people sign up for it. We've had, you know, hundreds of people watch the recording so far. And, and now with Mother's Day coming up, we're going to be doing a more concerted like marketing campaign to get these free classes out to more people. Um, but just one example how, you know, we were always planning on some of these products and some of these launches, but the pandemic has just kind of like accelerated it. And then also like made us more aware that we could cut out a lot of the fluff and a lot of the, you know, nice to have stuff and really just focus on how do we create the most value for aspiring, expecting and new parents right now when they need it the most, because people are going to remember the companies that stepped up during this time um, and provided that real value for people. So that was just our philosophy, like almost immediately into the pandemic. I think, you know, we had other competitors and like other companies who were slower to move on it. And they were thinking, you know, things are going to go back to normal and like we can just resume our you know normal marketing and normal business as usual plans in a couple of weeks and and we were kind of like we were just really quick to recognize that we needed to accelerate our plans and get these resources out you know as quickly as possible so it's a reminder if anyone has questions in the chat raise your hand uh just ask the question uh take yourself off mute um <laughs> And then I'll keep going. It looks like there's a question. Uh, Bill, you're on. You're on mute. Were you asking a question over there? Okay, talking to somebody else. Cool. Just want to make sure. Uh, so I asked this question of everybody. Oh wait, Annie, did you have a question? Yeah, I was curious on the users that you had sign up and take the first um, Zoom class that you're talking about. Were those people who were already within your network of users or were those new participants that found you because of the pandemic and their needs? That's a great question. Um, so based on the emails that we collected, actually about 75% of them were not in our network already. Um, and I think the reason was, was because when we announced the childbirth class, the shares on that post, um, let's say on Instagram, were really, really high. People were sharing this with their friends. They were tagging their friends who they knew were pregnant. 
and their class was being canceled. Um, so, you know, I know on Instagram analytics, it can sometimes be confusing. Are we optimizing for engagement? Are we optimizing for reach? Are we optimizing for saves, for shares? I think for us, this was a big wake up call with our social media audience that like, we need to optimize for shares. Um, because that's really how we're going to grow our audience. And that's really how we're going to get the lead gen so that we, when we launch our appointment booking in a, in a couple of months where you can actually book the appointment on the marketplace, um, that we have this nice group of new leads through these classes that we can market to. Let, let's follow that down. Let's follow that path a little bit. Um, yeah. You talked earlier about having a strong social media um, uh, presence. Was Is the marketing that you do is primarily through social media? Do you have, talk about how you market your services overall and perhaps how that has shifted since COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. I mean, you know, we have been around for a couple of years, um, but we did just do our first round of outside capital like a couple of months ago. So we're just now building up the team. It's a full-time team of three. So there's me, um, there's our head of like brand and strategy who really is taking on most of the marketing responsibilities right now. Um, because of her branding experience. And then we also have a head of provider relations who's just in charge of the providers and the supply side of the marketplace. Um, so in terms of our marketing, um, we have pretty much solely relied on organic social media growth. Um, I mean, as I alluded to in the beginning, when I first started sharing my own story, um, it was very raw and very real and very honest, which stood out on social media because that just wasn't how people were using social media three years ago. Um, and very quickly, we had other women and families submit their own stories to be shared on Robin. So we were sharing fertility journeys, pregnancy journeys, postpartum journeys, um, and I would say this like user-generated content has really been our um, you know, quote unquote, like organic marketing strategy from the beginning, um, we're continuing to do it. As we get more and more providers on board, though, we have their expertise to also um, use through our organic social media channels. So we have all of these providers who are creating content for us, whether it be, you know, how to improve your egg quality or, um, you know, 10 things to ask your OBGYN or, you know, how does fertility acupuncture work? And we're also repurposing all of that educational content on social media. So that really has been our strategy so far. I think we do now, um, we will when our platform, the, the um, appointment booking launches in July, we will do... Um, paid marketing campaigns around that. And that's really what the next like three months is for, for us is to really like work on the strategy and what that's going to look like. Um, because we'll finally have a metric to drive people essentially to convert. Um, and then the next step for the classes is to go from free to test paid classes. Um, and once we have that in place, we'll also have another metric where we can use um, you, where we can be optimizing for conversions. Um, but since we haven't had that, we really haven't had the, um, it hasn't made sense to put necessarily as much money into paid marketing because we didn't have that conversion metric yet. How are you building? Well, I guess going down the social media route, have you fallen into the tactic of trying to use influencers and build out uh, paid posts or anything along those directions. Um, you know, talk a little bit about how you're using Instagram primarily, because that sounds like your primary channel. Yeah. Um, you know, talk yeah. a little bit about Instagram. Yeah. So, I mean, we are very in tune with our user and our community. Like we're 95% women age 25 to 45 who are either actively trying to conceive pregnant or a new parent. Um, we did a ton of surveying with that community. So we know um, the content that they want to see, how we can deliver that content. 
Um, so really like knowing your audience and doing the research up front is really important. And that's con something we're constantly iterating because what our audience wants now during the pandemic is different than what they wanted pre pandemic. So constantly like reiterating that, um, research phase is really important. I think a lot of people skip over that and then they just like kind of assume what their audience wants to see and are just publishing posts to publish posts. Like we never set a post live without like a real intention of what this is going to do for us. Is it, uh, is it going to drive people to the site to read more about this real story, real journey from a, from a woman who's shared? Is it to drive people to the site to learn more about the educational article that we're featuring and, you know, educate and empower them on their journey through, through those articles? Um, is it like the childbirth class, something that's going to be really shareable um, and cause, you know, audience growth for us? So we're really intentional about what we post. Um, and we're very, um, we do keep it like really like authentic and organic on Instagram, which I think has helped. Um, what else about Instagram? Um you, definitely I, like a, I can definitely go into more um, topics on Instagram, but I'm, I'm forgetting where my um, train of thought was going. <laughs> how, about, how about some tactical things? Like how often do you post? Yeah. Do you always, what type of images do you use? How long is your uh, uh, block of text? Um, I'm also 9 a.m. in the morning, so my brain's not working as well either. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, what do, we, what, do we, what do we think about when you're building the post itself? To yeah. drive the most engagement. Yeah, so um, we are planning out our posts pretty far in advance. So we have always have like seven to ten posts that are planned. We use an app called Planoly, but there's a lot of apps. There's Later. There's a bunch of ones that can help with planning out content. Um, we post pretty much once a day. Um, so we average about five to seven posts a week. Um, sometimes we don't on the weekend, sometimes we do, it depends. Um, we, um, we have tested out a lot of different creatives. So that's another part of this process. It's not just research, it's also all the AB testing that goes into it. So um, does an, a real image of a woman in a hospital gown with a mask do better than her posed maternity photo shoot. Yes. For us, every time the raw real image does better. So we know we don't really post any, you know, superposed Pinterest mom, uh, you know, perfection um, images, but that's our audience. There are some accounts where those type, that type of imagery does really well. So that's just where it's really important to know your audience. Um, but I mean, in terms of something doing well on Instagram and, and outperforming the Instagram algorithm, you really need a super compelling image and a super compelling caption. Um, nothing will like cheat those two things. Like they have to be together. And if you get a super compelling image with a weak caption, your post is gonna do well on the algorithm, but it's never gonna do as well when the two are both really compelling where you're encouraging people to like, comment, share, save. Um, so yeah, I mean, that has generally been our um, tactics. I mean, we're constantly like updating like our hashtag um, strategy. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting, like, for a while it was on Instagram, it was like a vanity game and it was like, how many likes can you get? And we are, we had incredible engagement rates because we were very organic and authentic with our posts. Um, but now that we actually have products to drive people to, I mean, we have to really um, take on a little bit more of the tactical like B2C strategy of just like using Instagram to drive to site and to drive to purchase. So it's going to be an interesting time for us over the next couple of months of how we, um, how we still keep that authenticity and um, like real people feel, but also be able to use the tactics of driving people to buy classes to book providers um, so we're really like, we're kind of in the crux of that, but for now we're keeping it, 
you know, really organic and authentic because our, our goal right now is still audience growth and um, lead gen. How has your messaging changed post-COVID? How has our messaging changed? So something that I like to introduce um, before every live class that we do or that we've done is like, we believe maternal education and maternal wellness should be accessible to all pandemic or no pandemic. So speaking to my point before, like a lot of these plans were already in place um, and we believe that they should be seen through um, even more so obviously now during COVID, but that's been a lot of our messaging. So people really understand what is Robin? Is it something just for the pandemic that's virtual services? Like, no, Robin is something that needs to exist in the world, pandemic or no pandemic. People need this maternal education. They need the maternal wellness services available and accessible um, to them. So that's been one way that we've messaged. Actually, our messaging in some ways has not changed. I think the way our messaging has changed is in that we recognize we were always serving a vulnerable population, but now this population is extra vulnerable, right? So you have canceled IVF cycles, missed OBGYN appointments, traumatic births happening without partners, hospitals banning partners from, you know, labor and delivery. You have isolation and postpartum and parenthood where people suddenly they can't have their parents or a baby nurse or anybody help them and they have a newborn at home. Um, so I think just like really, really um, understanding like the sensitivity and the vulnerabilities of our population. Um, and then on the other side as well, I mean, our providers are also a vulnerable population right now. They're all small businesses. Um, some of them have had physical locations that have closed or may never reopen again as they shift their entire practices to digital. So being really conscious of the struggles that they're going through. Um, so I, I would say some of our messaging hasn't changed in that like our mission we really believe is pandemic or no pandemic, but um, in, in everything that we do, we're trying to have that like sensitivity um, and understanding um, that these are unprecedented times for these two vulner vulnerable populations and always keeping that in mind, um, whatever we say, whatever we post, you know, whatever our, our brand messaging would be. I had a question about your A-B testing. Um, I suck at social media. <laughs> Luckily, I have somebody else to help me. <laughs> but one thing that we're looking at is in terms of strategy, <clears throat> I love what you said about the content having to be a captivating image with a captivating caption. And I think one thing when we're looking at metrics is the not knowing how to attribute what's being successful. Is it the time? Is it the content? Is it what the picture looks like um, in terms of A-B testing, because it's hard for us to draw like correlation versus causation. Do you have any tools or resources that have been particularly helpful for you in either the testing and the analytics and metrics, and also just in growing your audience and connecting with people who genuinely fit within your audience? Yeah, so um, I don't know how long you've been posting, but we've been posting now for a couple of years. Um, so we have, that whole library of data. So what we'll tend to do on Instagram analytics is you can sort, let's say by one year in terms of all the different categories. So like reach, impressions, engagement. And we look at like the top 10 and we look at the bottom 10. And we start to really just think about themes. Like what's the theme that's happening? Because to your point, you could go crazy analyzing every single post and figuring out like what the, you know, reason it was successful or the reason it wasn't successful. Um, so we really try and think about it like thematically because that is much more obvious to identify what's working and what's not working. Um, that's one tactic that we've used in terms of like time of the day and like that sort of thing. To me, that variation is going to be much smaller than the variation in your image and your caption. So to me, if you're someone who's just figuring it all out, I would like ignore the time of the day stuff. 
I would ignore like that stuff because it's really about, it's really going to be about the content and does the, does your audience want to see that content and want to engage with that content? Like something we realized about our captions that we were doing a lot of like fluffy call to actions, like tag a strong mama. And it's like, everybody like knows a strong mama. Like that's fluffy. That's not really a call to action. A call to action is like, tell us about your C-section. Like women want to tell about their C-section. Like, oh my God. I mean, we had a hundred comments all about, you know, their C-section. And then all of a sudden we had this library of now new user generated content that we could repurpose for new posts in the future. So that was something like we realized was that um, when we were doing that like thematic bundling, we're like, oh wow, like all these bottom posts, they have call to actions, but is this something I would respond to? Tag a strong mama? Probably not. You know, the bump and motherly and all of those bump dated and all these other mommy blogger accounts are all posting that type of fluffy stuff. So like how can we you know, differentiate, it was like asking real solid calls to action that people felt compelled to really share. Um, so that's just one example. But I, yeah, I would say like trying to look at it thematically, ignoring the time of the day stuff, because that's really going to be that's like once you've perfected the content, then like figure out, oh, is it better to post at like 7pm or 9pm? Um, but like, that's going to be way more marginal than your actual content. Thank you. Yeah. Curious. One of the things that, that sort of comes to mind for me is, um, why did you pick Instagram as your primary focus? Like what, what about the platform speaks to your community and helps you build an authentic, uh, community? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, it was something that started really from a personal story. So that would choice might have been a little bit subconscious. But at the same time, I think you have to be where your users are. And we recognize that so much of the, you know, aspiring expecting a new parent community was on Instagram. I mean, we saw especially since we started more with fertility, we saw people were creating accounts on Instagram just for their fertility journey. So they had their personal account, Ali Kassir, but then they had their TTC account, which was, you know, trying to conceive one, two, three, TTC one, two, three. And um, so that was just like a, a tactical like observation that we had made early on. Um, but I think now what we're realizing is with all these social media platforms, they definitely are saturated. Um, and there comes a point, I think, in any company's evolution that you really have to, like, take a step back, widen the marketing lens and say, like, what other channels do we need to optimize? So that's a little bit of the process we're in right now. We just started a Pinterest. We know there are a ton of, um, of women and families who are at, um, accessing Pinterest um, during this time, um, and it's a great um, it's a great search tool. It's great in terms of website traffic. So we've just added Pinterest to the mix. Um, we are in over the next couple of months going to take a real hard look at our SEO strategy as well. So, you know, I, I think, you know, you have to get start depending on your team and your capacity and your bandwidth, you have to get started somewhere. For us, it was Instagram. And now I think we're in this period of time where, we want to keep that going. It's clearly like an excellent, you know, community for us, but we also want to like zoom out a little bit on the marketing lens and see what other channels we can, um, we can optimize. And how, how, I guess the other question I have is, is you're getting people at a, a specific point in time, right? They're at, at the point of they're thinking through conception or having difficulty conceiving mm -hmm. um but motherhood is is uh and I, it's weird for me to say this is not a mother but it's a <laughs> lifelong thing right yeah. like it's things that happen forever how do you how do you see your business growing over time with how do you keep that community going long term um and how do you think about about your company's focus as time goes on are you going to continue to focus on the beginning of the journey or are you going to build out sort of a lifelong path so, I mean, we really now have almost more providers that specialize in prenatal and pregnancy care 
than we even do fertility providers. And what we've shown over the past year is that our content, specifically on Instagram, some of our pregnancy and parenthood content is doing better than our fertility content at this point. Um, for instance, the childbirth class for expecting parents, um, you know, had the most signups, then the lactation and postpartum, then the trying to conceive class had the least amount. So what we've done over the past year is really try to widen our breadth of the entire journey to parenthood from fertility to parenthood. And I think we've done that, but to be honest, like that's really kind of where we want to stop. Like we are not doing menopause. We are not doing puberty or sexual health. Like we want to be there for people during the six to seven years where they are creating their families and be really, really good at that. Um, you could think of like our long-term dream as like being a Zola for, you know, creating families. Um, and that's a good example, I think, because they've put a stake in the ground. They're like, we're doing weddings um, and we're going to do them really well. And that's how we feel. Like we want to do this stage fertility to early parenthood really, really well. Um, and we think that there's a tremendous market opportunity to do that um, without becoming generic women's health or femtech where we're encompassing, you know, all the way from menopause to puberty. Um, so that's really like our strategy right now was, you know, get people to understand that Robin isn't just fertility anymore. It also is other parts of the journey as well, which we've we've, we've done and we're continuing to do, but then at that point, like kind of stop there because, um, we just really want to be focused in who our customer is. And so we got a couple questions around fundraising. So I'm, I'm going to ask yeah. a few fundraising questions, which, which as a former founder, it's always a painful conversation to have, but, uh, <laughs> you, um, you didn't raise money right off the bat. You sort of built the company for a while and then raised money. Um, what was, what was the strategy there and why did you decide to raise money now rather than continue to bootstrap? So, I mean, I was fortunate that I was coming out of eight years at JP Morgan making a lot of money. So I had a fair bit of savings to like play around with. And, um, that's just how I felt most comfortable starting the company and bootstrapping as most people do, um, you know, and there were points along the way where I was always networking with investors. I mean, I was in New York, you know, whenever we would have an influencer post about us, I would get an investor inquiry and like, I would talk to them, but it was never we're raising. It was just, Hey, like learn about us. Here's an intro call. So, I mean, by the time I actually went to raise, I already had a list of like a hundred people that I had spoken to in the past couple of years. So it was always in the back of my mind. Um, and there was actually, it's a funny story. Um, it actually kind of, the fundraising kind of happened in a, in a weird way, how it usually doesn't happen. Um, I was planning on continuing to bootstrap. We had just moved to LA. Um, I had just had my third kid. So we moved to LA in November, 2018. I had my third kid in February, 2019. Um, we launched a new site with like 30 founding providers in May, uh, May. And then we ended up having, getting our lead investor in June. And the way that we got our lead investor, she had started following us on Instagram, really organic. Um, she was going through her own fertility, parenthood, uh, pregnancy, parenthood journey herself, um, reached out. We had like a bunch of conversations again, always informal, always, you know, not raising, not raising, not raising. Um, and I would say she is really the person who empowered me to go for it. Um, and like getting the lead was for us very easy. Um, and then because it had come about in this more like ad hoc haphazard way, actually it took a little while to find the additional investors to fill out the round where I think for most people, the hardest thing is actually getting the lead. And then once they do, they're able to fill the round more quickly. So our story is a little bit different. Um, but in terms of like why I think, 
you know, my personal preference was not to do like a friends and family round. Um, it wasn't something I really felt comfortable with. And I think a lot of founders are scared to say that um, because technically, like if you, you know, are so passionate about your company, you know, you should be willing to take like, you know, anyone's money, family, friends, because, you know, you want to make this a success. And for me, that just like, that wasn't the case. So I was always trying to bootstrap it to a place where I could get institutional investors. And that's really what we did. So I probably bootstrapped longer than people would have done um, because they would have gotten that maybe friends and family and smaller like convertible notes along the way. For us, I mean, never raised capital, kept building the business. And then like when it was ready, we did like a proper 1.2 million, you know, pre-seed straight equity round. And that was just something that I personally was, was looking for. And it was right for us. It's not right for everybody. It's not right for every founder, but that's, you know, that's how our, our raise went. How did you raise money? Do you feel that your pacing has changed or your goals have changed? Um, I think our pace has gotten quicker because the team has grown, not necessarily because we have VCs who are like calling us and saying, move faster, move faster, move faster. I think, you know, when I hadn't raised, a lot of people scared me about this like VC treadmill. And yeah, I mean, I think that exists. But if you find the right partners for your business that that are really aligned with um, your goals and the mission, I don't think that's as big of an issue. And maybe that's just, just because we've done one round and maybe it'll, you know, I'll, I'll feel differently after, you know, our seed or series a or anything like that. But, um, for me, it, it, the pace hasn't quickened because of like pressure from investors. It's definitely quickened because of the team and, and frankly, like how relevant we are right now and how important it is to move quickly right now. So let's talk a little bit about the relevance. Do you think that you are more relevant in a pandemic than outside of a pandemic? Like, how do you see the pandemic affecting your business generally? I do. I mean, our traffic from April was the highest traffic we've ever seen. So, you know, there is data to back it up. Um, but I do think that there is... Um, really a moment right now for telemedicine, for virtual health services, for virtual wellness services, and that the landscape is going to change post pandemic. Um, like I said, a lot of our providers will never open their one person, you know, shop again, they may start doing like home visits and you know, when things open up, but you know, their business that we see, like, um, on the ground, how their business are, are shifting and how quickly that's happening. So, um, I do think our relevancy score is pretty high. And I think that's what this pandemic has done in the startup world is like some people are really relevant and some people aren't. And if you aren't, it's really a decision whether you're going to use this time to pivot so that your relevancy score goes up or, you know, you're taking the gamble that things will return to normal and there will be a point where, you know, your business becomes relevant again. Um, we, I, you know, we're just, a, that's just a little bit lucky for us, you know, that, you know, our, our business model and our mission and everything is really relevant right now. And do you see that accelerating out of COVID or do you see that shifting back to pre-COVID? No, I think that, you know, I think once people realize, let's say that they don't have to sit in a hospital for a birthing class or they don't have to, you know, do some of these services in person, I, I think that trend will continue post COVID. I mean, it's hard to know for sure people's behavior, but to me, that trend will continue. The other trend that I think is interesting is you know, during the last recession, during 08, 08, 09, you saw a lot of people starting new businesses, e-commerce businesses, wellness businesses, like a lot of people decided, hey, I've been laid off, like I'm just gonna become a wellness coach or a doula or you know, I'm gonna work for myself. And um, this population of providers is so interesting because a lot of them are women themselves. They feel really strongly about the work that they're doing and, and they feel like advocates. Um, and a lot of them are moms themselves. Um, and these professions give them a ton of flexibility and they can be very lucrative 
um, you know, the, um, jobs. I mean, a lactation consultant in some cases charges, you know, $300 for a 45 minute session. Um, so I, my view on the provider side is that we're going to see an acceleration of wellness providers come to market during this time, especially with, you know, 30 million people unemployed right now, and that's going to keep going up. So, um, again, I think these providers are going to need to differentiate, um, and a platform like Robin, um, which in some cases for some of our providers is serving as their only website. Like they don't have a website. They don't have a social media handle. They're giving people their Robin, you know, profile and soon people will be able to book them directly on Robin. So, um, I think there are a lot of supporting trends. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I do think a lot of them will continue post pandemic, although, you know, it's hard to know for sure. Given that, that, that there's this belief that you're going to see an increase in providers and that you serve sort of this dual market, dual sided market that seems to both, both sides be at least growing, um, you know, what responsibility do you feel as a CEO to your community and to the community at large? To the community of providers or the community of parents? Both. Like what, what, what do you feel a difference? Like, let me ask the question differently to make sure that I'm, I'm actually asking the question that I want to ask, which yeah. is, um, you know, beforehand you had this, this, responsibility around growing a business and you were testing things and things yeah. were moving along and you raised money, which was great. Yeah. Now we're in this situation where you've got 30 million people out of work, and some that are going to be looking to wellness coaching and a platform like yours to actually generate revenue for their own families. Yeah. And then you've got mothers and, and women who are going through a fertility process and a parenting process in a new reality, right? With, with um, less access to help and other things. Do you feel that you as CEO of a, of a business that's sitting in the center of all of that has a greater sort of social responsibility? Um, and how do, you, how do you look to manage that social responsibility um, as you build your business? Like, how do you, how do you balance, yeah. I got to build a business and I got to do something good? Right. Yeah, it's hard. And that's something I've struggled with, frankly, like from the beginning, because we've always been really mis mission driven. I mean, when we started building the provider network, for instance, you know, we surveyed women and said, like, what are your biggest challenges? And they came back and they said, stigma, the fact that I feel really alone in what I'm going through. I don't have emotional support. Um, people said misinformation because they go on message boards and you know, you can go into a Google rabbit hole and have users giving you a ton of misinformation about this time. Um, and then the other challenge was accessibility. You know, a lot of women said, look, I have my OBGYN, but they are my only outlet. And they give me seven minutes of their time. And when I ask them questions about emotional and mental health, pelvic floor, nutrition, all of these things, like they can't help me. Um, and they don't, you know, have the bandwidth, they're not compensated to help me. And there's no platform that complements what they're doing. So, you know, we've always had these issues in mind as like the challenges that we want to solve for this community and this population. So, I mean, that, um, that mission, like is always, it is always driving me um, like all the time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. Like I don't think you can be focused on doing good and not on making money or on making money and like not doing good. So, um, you know, we, um, we just, you know, we try and balance it the best that, that we can. I think, in the current pandemic, there's just been this focus on create real value, like no fluff. What do people need? What right now? And like, give it to them. And that is something that, you know, why we went so quickly on the classes. Um, I think that's really true to like the, the right now. Um, but, you know, there is going to be a time where like we have, we have a limited runway. We're going to have to raise again. 
to raise again, we have to have, you know, meet certain metrics and prove out our business models. So that all has to be there too. So, um, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's, you mentioned before, like this is going back a while ago, but you mentioned something about an influencer strategy. Like for us, we don't have to pay influencers because influencers feel so strongly, especially, you know, famous mommy bloggers about what we're doing and what we're creating. So it helps us. Um, it really does to have that social mission, um, buoys us. So, you know, it's, they're always both in mind. They're both in balance. They're not necessarily in, you know, contrast, um, is probably what I'd say. Um, on the small business side and the provider side, um, I mean, we're also, we're trying to solve their pain points. I mean, their pain points are that they're highly localized. They have trouble standing out from the saturated world of general wellness. Um, they are not experts in marketing or technology or, you know, any of these more like admin functions. So we're starting with appointment booking and payment processing, but I could see a point where we're helping them with like insurance claims or we're helping them with other software capabilities that make their lives easier, businesses run better and really like empowers their business. I guess one really important point and how we differ maybe from other, um, you know, wellness marketplaces is, you know, you go on, let's say, Maven or, you know, another competitor and you connect with one of their providers, you know, Sarah P and you're like, who is Sarah P? Like Sarah P is a real person with their own small business, but you know, Maven isn't really doing anything to help promote and empower that small business to grow. Like we are the opposite. If you look at our listings on Robin, like we have everybody's full names, we have their websites, we have their Instagram handles, we have their email addresses. Like we have it all maybe to a fault and we're figuring that out and we're testing out, you know, exactly how much we should be sharing, but it is our responsibility to help these um, providers and small businesses grow and give them a platform in which that they can do that. So um, that's something again was a conscious choice even pre pandemic. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know. Maybe it was just a lot of rambling. <laughs> Great. And we're coming here uh, up to the end. So okay. I always, always like to end um, these on a positive note where we can, because, we, you know, pandemic is not a positive conversation to have more often than not. Yeah. So would love to hear over the last couple months with all the things that you faced as CEO of Robin, what's the thing you're most proud of? Hmm. Um, oof. A couple of things. Um, I think personally, I always questioned whether I could merge my professional life and my family life. I was always, you know, quick to like get out the door into the office because I didn't really think I could do both. Um, and I'm really proud of how I've approached this time personally and balancing my professional and, and family life. And you know what, if my kid has to join a Zoom call, they have to join a Zoom call and that's okay. And I'm a female solo founder with three kids under four. And like, that's just what it is. And, you know, so being really um, true to um, me as a whole and me as like a, a, an entire person and not just a CEO, I think has been something I'm really proud of. I'm also really proud of our team in terms of the radical prioritization we're doing and like what's important, what's not um, like, and that's something we're all being forced to do right now. And I'm really proud of um, the things that we're focusing on now and being able to um, get through that, that radical prioritization. Um, what else? Um, I mean, I've talked about this a lot, but I am really proud of like the resources that we're getting out to, to women and families in need right now and the, the providers in need right now. Um, yeah, um, I think that's, that probably sums it up. <laughs> Definitely things to be proud of. Um, I think we're all, we're all trying to figure out how to balance life and work. And um, 
and and having having listened to you sort of figure out uh, how to do that, both as a mother and a CEO, I think is inspiring and, and helpful. Hopefully, helpful to everybody that was here. Um, when we don't get a lot of questions, I always worry that I, that uh, that it wasn't as helpful, but maybe that's the opposite. Maybe it was more helpful because we got people were listening. Um, <laughs> Appreciate you taking the time. I know that Thank it's you. morning and, and you've got a business to run. I uh, appreciate everybody who's here um, and the questions that were asked. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. Our plan is to do more of these type of events moving forward. And I'm going to turn it back to Andy to wrap it up. Yeah, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today. Thank you, Ali, um, for that fantastic conversation. Uh, really helpful insights. Um, of, you hit on a lot of points that I know I'm personally struggling with running an, an organization, and I've heard from other founders um, that they're struggling with during this time. So really fantastic insights. We really appreciate your time this morning. Uh, Miha, thank you always uh, for running these uh, events and facilitating the conversations. Such a great job. Um, and to everybody else, uh, please stay safe, stay healthy, um, connect with us however you want. We're, we, I put up our contact information for Miha, Allison, and uh, myself. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and then uh, I know that there's a, a additional Grasshopper uh, employees online. Um, we will send out a recap email with the takeaways. And uh, again, this was the first time we're recording it. Fantastic conversation to start with. We hope uh, to see you at the next event and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Guys, take Thanks care. Everyone. Stay safe.